We're ready to go. Hello, and welcome to this sixth session on Prussia in the age of Napoleon. Um, we have three speakers in this particular panel. Um, we have uh, Mike Legere, Vanya, uh, F. Timova, Bellinger, and Ethan Sivji. I would like to introduce our first speaker this evening, who is Gebhard Leberich, I mean, uh, Michael V. Legere. <laughs> Uh, he is Professor of History, Deputy Director of the Military History Center at the University of North Texas. He got his PhD in 1997 under Don Horwood uh, at FSU's Institute on Napoleon and the French Revolution. He's an active member of the Society for Military History and represents uh, the University of North Texas on the board of directors of the Consortium on Revenu Revolutionary Europe. He's also a colleague of mine as a trustee on the Massena Society. His award-winning books include Napoleon and the Struggle for Germany, Cambridge University Press 2015, uh, Blücher, Scourge of Napoleon 2014, winner of the Military History, Society for Military History's 2015 Distinguished Book Award for a biography, um, and also The Fall of Napoleon, Volume 1, The Allied Invasion of France, Cambridge University Press 2007, another award-winning volume. So, uh, Mike, is going to talk to us about potatoes. I look forward to this. Thank you very much, Mike. Well, thank you very much, Peter. That was a very gracious introduction. And thank you for filling in for uh, Victor today. And I uh, want to say thank you to, to Alex for this wonderful first annual conference. I hope it's one of many more that's going to come. Um, the paper I have today doesn't really reach any definitive conclusions. It's uh, a work in progress. And I never really cared when people used to say that at, at conferences, but now I, I understand it um, a little bit more. And it's an offshoot of, my, of the work I've been doing on the Prussian general of von Bülow, who I wrote my dissertation on and had promised the Bülow family that I would turn it into a book. So I've been expanding it um, if, you know, to fill in gaps. And I was gonna completely skip over the Bavarian succession until I came across um, some memoirs, uh, one from a, um, a Prussian lieutenant and then the other one from a, a Prussian general and uh, really opened my eyes to some of the problems with, with the officer corps. So I was kind of inspired by, um, by uh, Samuel Scott's book um, from Valmy to, um, uh, uh, I'm sorry, from Yorktown to Valmy, um, where he looks at the, uh, the French who served in the American Revolutionary War and then where they were at Valmy or if they were at Valmy. I don't know if I'll have the same success as he did because uh, the French archives are still intact where the Pr Prusso German or not. But um, I guess the, the, the thesis that I'm working on or, or what I'm exploring is a better way to put it is um, taking these issues that the Prussian officer corps had in this little known war, um, can we trace some of these to uh, the 1790s, the war, the first coalition, and ultimately, of course, uh, the war, the fourth coalition and the disaster at Jena and Auerstedt. So the germs of rot, the Prussian officer corps and the Kartoffel Krieg. This little known war variously called the war of the Bavarian succession, the Bayerisch uh, Befogel Krieg, the potato war, the plum scrum, uh, even the Fort Silesian war marks the last 18th century conflict between two great powers. Oh, I got a little PowerPoint I forgot to put up. Everybody see that? Yes? Okay. So we see in, uh, okay, uh, ex except for a brief appearance in 1792, the wars of kings ended in 1779. We see in the Bavarian War all the classic elements of 18th century or Matin's uh, strategy, the strategy of exhaustion. Rather than attacking the Austrians, Frederick II attempted to use maneuver to gain an advantage over his adversary, yet feared venturing too far from his tenuous lines of communication leading back to Silesia. As for the Austrians, they remained perfectly content watching Frederick's army suffer after the Prussians exhausted the countryside of food for man and horse. Both sides demonstrated a surprising lack of energy and decisiveness. The fear of being outflanked or enveloped, or enveloped mastered their planning. 
Movements devolved into a series of feints and demonstrations designed to avoid a major engagement. Detachments were sent far and wide, only to exhaust the troops and horses with numerous mind-numbing back and forth marches. Given the length of the conflict from 5 July 1778 to 7 March 1779, eight months, and the fact that no major battle was fought, the financial and human costs are phenomenally out of proportion. Regarding Frederick the Great, much has been written about the king's lethargy and downright evil mood during this war. Other accounts claim that rather than the glorious fritz of the Seven Years' War, he appeared weak and feeble and unsure of himself. The issue of whether Frederick pursued a sound strategy still remains open to debate. As for culpability, Christopher Duffy maintains that Frederick bears the ultimate responsibility for the shortcomings in 1778. Rather than continue the evaluation of the great Frederick, it is more instructive for our story to address the larger question of what, if any, systemic flaws in the army can be identified that may have had an impact 30 years later on the battlefields of Jena and Auerstedt. Many of the company grade officers who served during the Bavarian War would be field grade officers in 1806, just as many of the field grade officers of 1778 were general officers by 1806. Thus, what issues in the conduct of the officer corps during the Bavarian War indicated decay that might manifest itself during the French Wars? To begin, Komar van der Goetz is very clear about the impact of Frederick's generalship on the Duke of Brunswick. The, uh, the future Prussian commander in chief in 1806. This, well, trying to get the PowerPoint slide. There we go. That this last, uh, this is a uh, Komar Vonnegut's quote, that this last campaign of Frederick's, which was the opposite of actual warfare, had an effect and left traces in the army with regard to the idea of what actual warfare is, appears all too natural to be doubted. It was disastrous that the Duke of Brunswick, the later unfortunate general of Jena and Auerstedt, was at his side, uh, Frederick's side. Moreover, Goetz claims that, quote, the campaign had a depressing effect on the army. The despondency that nothing had happened spread after the return from Bohemia, even among the officers, and the losses to dysentery were so great that an energetic invasion probably would, have, would not have cost more in terms of lives but would have promised a brilliant victory at least." Unquote. In his assessment of the Prussian army from the Seven Years' War to the War of the Fourth Coalition, Goetz may be guilty of teleology at times, yet the same cannot be said of Colonel Friedrich Wilhelm von Schmettau, who served in the King's headquarters during the campaign until Frederick forced him to resign his commission in September of 1778. Immediately in 1789, he wrote a scathing critique of the war with an eye for the junior officers, explaining, quote, there is no better way to heal and prevent young people from vice than to make them aware of the consequences and the sad victims among them. In this way, this painting of the misery of our camp during the war will be more beneficial than all the most complicated regulations to attract the attention of the military man so that he can carefully guard against the lack of military discipline and order which is the most terrible spirit of an army, unquote. Interestingly, interestingly, both Schmettau and Goetz excuse the officers. Quote, however, the army, even in its generals, cannot be accorded guilt, uh, according to Goetz, nor has it been accorded to them. For Frederick and Henry's authority were too great for a third to provide a different direction without their approval, let alone act against their will. The officers murmured and shook their heads, but it was quietly said that the great king must have had his sad reasons for things to proceed as they did rather than otherwise, unquote. According to Schmettau, quote, the officers, accustomed to blind and dumb obedience to the king's will, were not allowed to express their concerns or speak of the present danger, unquote. Many historians point to Napoleon as the first to implement a system of living off the land, but Frederick believed in the same principle. Quote, people must know that they have the enemy in their country, he once stated. Foraging played a huge role in the Bavarian War, as Frederick remained determined to provide for his army at Austria's expense. Massive foraging missions became part of everyday life for the Prussians while in Bohemia. Such was the need of forage that Frederick even ordered the soldiers' wives to participate in its gathering. 
Yet neither Frederick nor any of the general officers took steps to organize and regulate the foraging process. The haphazard foraging practices not only devastated the regions where the Prussians camped, but deprived the army of some two thirds of the foodstuffs that was collected. It is clear that the army's strict guidelines for foraging were not followed by officers of any rank. Schmettau, who, as noted, was part of Frederick's suite for most of the 1778 campaign, notes that the troops, quote, were deprived of the resources that this area could have provided to sustain them for two months. If more had been done in terms of good order and discipline on the marches, in the camps, and during the foraging, they would have uh, been preserved. He further explains that, quote, the army lacked everything by the third day of the invasion of Bohemia because it was allowed to destroy everything in the tortured, needy, tired soldiers deserted in herds to escape their misery. The disorder reached the highest level, unquote. According to Schmettau, Prussian foraging practices were so wasteful that, quote, three quarters were destroyed to snatch one fourth. All areas where the troops were encountered showed signs of the devastation. What a pitiful sight, a sight that, no, that did no honor to disciplined troops and which covered the officers with shame because they had, to, had to tolerate such cruel nonsense. Schmettau's statement that the officers had to tolerate this behavior certainly raises questions about the efficacy of the Prussian tradition of discipline and obedience, backed by the cruelest of punishments. Yet faced with an army that was starving to death, the officers may have felt that they had no other choice than to allow the men to run rampant. The situation points to a breakdown of discipline that the officers tolerated because, according to Schmettau, quote, nobody was assigned the task of taking care of the army's needs. Everything was missing. Without camp straw, the soldier had to sleep on the bare earth. The utmost lawlessness devastated the whole area around the camp, where all sources of sustenance were destroyed by disorder and looting. Illnesses and desertion soon arose as the natural consequences of such a desperate situation. And in five weeks, stole the incredible number of 6,000 to 7,000 men from the army. As we will see, dereliction of duty by company grade officers while the army marched and camp became widespread. Regarding the camp, Schmetto adds that, quote, the most general and traditional precautions for their safety were neglected, unquote. Sloppiness marked the army's outposts and escort duties. On several occasions, the Austrians managed to surprise Prussian posts and even their main camps, particularly during the winter of 1778 and 1779. And all of this points to officer negligence. Lastly, Schmettau first sounded the demand that would become increasingly louder over the next 30 years. The army needed a general staff. Okay, now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the campaign. Um, it's very hard to find a map on the War of Bavarian Succession. This is the best I could find. Disregard the pinkish red arrows. Those were uh, Frederick's initial plans. Instead, the, the blue or purplish arrows is actually what happened. And the area that Frederick is operating in is between uh, Koniggratz and Hohenelbe. That's uh, right on the Elbe River. And that's as far as he got. Okay. For the campaign, Frederick planned to form two armies of some 85,000 men each to invade Bohemia. The army he would personally lead mustered on the Silesia Bohemian border, while the other, commanded by his brother, Prince Henry, marshaled in Saxony. Fearing that the Austrians would invade Silesia before his army was ready, Frederick issued orders on 24 March to expedite the mobilization. Altogether, the King's army would number 80 battalions, 123 squadrons, and 473 guns. For most junior officers, this meant going to war for the first time. To begin, many must have been excited. One West Prussian lieutenant notes, while some of our people displayed depression and sadness saying goodbye to relatives and marched away fighting back tears, the foreigners who left no friends behind showed their happiness and how much they wanted to leave the barracks where they had spent so many boring years. Most of the officers felt the same joy and all were filled with hope for a successful campaign. Secondly, combat experience offered the best opportunity for a promotion as opposed to the incredibly slow ascent through the ranks during peacetime. According to uh, Article 14 of Frederick's 12 April 1778 instructions for commanders and battalions, quote, the officers who distinguish themselves through their bravery or their ability will immediately advance one grade in the army, unquote. Third, 
financially well-off lieutenants could afford certain privileges, such as co-opting a private from his company to serve as his Batman. Although regulations prohibited officers from employing privates in this capacity during wartime, exceptions were often made. The junior officer would have really benefited if his Batman was married, like the private who served the West Prussian lieutenant. And according to the West Prussian lieutenant, quote, this fellow had married shortly before his departure from Marienburg. His wife cooked excellent food and was a very good person overall. I can only advise all subaltern, subaltern officers to get a married servant because one woman always performs better than three male servants, unquote. Depending on the wealth of the lieutenant, he could also hire a footman. According to our West Prussian lieutenant, during our march through Poland, I hired a boy of about 15 who an officer had brought from Konigsberg, but then chased off because he could no longer feed him. He had to do my hair and carry my spontoon and frock coat during the marches, and he also carried a canteen with him, which contained everything necessary for making coffee. It appears that our West Prussian lieutenant had deep pockets, as this fortunate officer went on campaign with three horses instead of the normal two. One I rode, he recalls, one carried my personal items, and the third was actually for the wife of my servant, who always followed immediately behind the furriers. And when I came to the camp or quarters, I found everything already well furnished, unquote. If that was not enough, the West Prussian also employed a train connect, uh, which is a baggage servant who was also married, who also brought his wife, and his job was to care for the lieutenant's horses. The lieutenant boasts that during the 22 months the train connect was in his service, quote, my horses never lacked forage. He always managed to get some. For his care for me and my horses, he risked being hanged or beaten on hundreds of occasions. occasions. I had selected him from among all the people of the company because of his rare love for horses and replaced my train connect with him. Like the bat, unquote. Like the Batman, the train cadet was also married, as, as I mentioned. So you think about that lieutenant, three horses, uh, all the servants and their wives, uh, and you multiply that uh, across an army. And this leads us to some of the problems with the Prussian army in 1806: endless uh, trains uh, and camp followers, and so forth, and so forth. Regulations did caution wealthy officers against bringing the luxuries of home with them on campaign. According to Frederick's manual, quote, his majesty strictly charges all officers not to carry more baggage than is absolutely necessary. If an officer's baggage falls into enemy hands, his majesty will only reimburse the quantity that is indispensably necessary. Even if the officer's loss is no fault of his own, he must absorb the loss of all extraordinary and superfluous possessions. In terms of wagons for company grade officers, the king remained inflexible, quote, his majesty will allow a captain one company wagon, one baggage wagon, and one bread wagon. That's for each captain. Subaltern officers are only to have baggage horses and every wagon kept by a subaltern officer after the army is assembled will be burnt, unquote. Frederick makes clear that his generals and commanders of regiments are, quote, to ensure that the instructions concerning the baggage of officers are observed with the utmost exactness on all occasions. They themselves shall be answerable for the slightest neglect in this matter. Okay, the fourth thing that would have excited a junior officer was that the march to either Silesia or Saxony would most likely represent the junior officer's first experience of being in a saddle for an extended period. Depending on the quality of his horses and his Batman and his connect, the uh, luxury of riding could have been short-lived. The West Prussian Lieutenant continues, the joy of our young officers seeing themselves suddenly mounted cannot be described, and you hardly have any idea of what to make of it when you see one ride all day to full gallop, beating his servants and exhausting his horse under him. Several of them rode their horses in such a way that they had to make their next march on foot because their horses went lame. Among the Batman, only a Batman, only about a dozen were accustomed to handling horses. The rest of them acted horribly stupid and every moment you saw a horse throw its rider and run, unquote. In addition to these problems, officers made the mistake of misleading their men by telling them that the daily march would last for merely four or five hours when the march table called for at least eight to 10 hours, and in some cases, even more. As soon as the anticipated time to halt had passed, but the march continued, the soldiers became visibly upset and impatient. The longer the march, the greater the negative impact on morale. 
in direct violation of Article 2 of Frederick's 12 April 1778 instructions for commanders and battalions, company grade officers frequently left their platoons at the beginning of the march and did not return. This led to the violation of the manual's directions for the prevention of all manner of irregularities in night quarters and on the march, which states, which state, quote, strict order and discipline among the soldiers must always be preserved and all irregularities prohibited, especially on a march and in night quarters, unquote. Apparently in the absence of the company officers, some NCOs failed to enforce Frederick's standing orders that quote, officers cannot allow their men to drink alcohol on a march, especially in hot weather. They cannot allow their men's wives to bring them beer, unquote. According to the West Prussian quote, Left on their own, some soldiers acted like fools, drinking alcohol and howling, especially when told that the day's march would be short. As the march continued and the effects of the alcohol wore off, exhaustion and dehydration overcame these soldiers. They soon became deathly silent, a sure sign that they could not go on much longer. Music and encouragement from a comrade proved to be the best means to keep them marching. Water consumption posed another problem caused by the absent, uh, absence of company grade officers. Without them present to limit the consumption of water, some parched privates resorted to drinking standing water from muddy puddles, which of course led to a multitude of diseases. Platoon leaders who ensured a steady supply of potable water and limited its consumption through proper supervision proved to be the best remedy. In response to these problems caused by absentee company officers, the King issued a directive in July 1799, uh, 1779 stating that, quote, because of the many disorders and other circumstances noted in the last war by the officers of the infantry, especially by the commanders of the regiments and battalions, it must be enforced with the greatest vigor that the officers remain with their platoons and be prohibited from being absent on the penalty of 14 days of incarceration, unquote. Ongoing negotiation prompted Frederick to camp the army in two waves in a reserve east of the border with Bohemia. The army remained his camp, in this camp from 12 May to 2 July, 1778. Many of the officers believed that the prospect of war had vanished. The malaise of camp life contributed to a dereliction of duty by the NCOs and company officers on the small unit level. Soldiers were grouped in small units called the Kameradschaften. Each consisted of between six and seven privates supervised by one corporal. The men of each Kameradschaft shared a tent and pooled their resources to cook common meals. Each Kameradschaft Führer, corporal in charge, closely supervised his privates, especially the known troublemakers, and monitored, quote, the fulfillment of their, day, of their duties and morality, unquote. Article 1 of Frederick's 12 April 1778 instructions for commanders and battalions called for each Kameradschaft Führer to bring his Kameradschaft to the tent of the company captain for inspection before the day's march commenced, uh, commenced. After the troops settled in the camp, it appears that the NCOs, junior officers, and quite possibly some of the company captains became negligent in their supervision of the men. According to the West Prussian Lieutenant, quote, various precautions for the health and benefit of the men were supposed to have been taken in the camps, but everything was ne neglected and nothing was done to maintain their health, although this is the cornerstone of all successful armies. Unquote. The King's proximity kept the general officers on edge, and this, of course, trickled down to the field grade officers. It was very exhausting to march, notes the West Prussian lieutenant. It was all the more tiring because our commander, instead of letting the men rest, had them fix their hair and clean their cartridge pouches and sabers, as he had been told that the regiment would file before the King. If crossing the numerous mountains that lie between Silberberg and Glatz, uh, Glatz wasn't exhausting enough, our men got far more tired from the generals insisting that the king would appear. When a rider was perceived in the distance, the officers shouted, the king is coming, march well, carry your muskets correctly, no smoking, etc." Such panic tired the soldiers far more than the effort of the march, all the more when they recognized its futil futility, unquote. Schmetal particularly criticized Frederick for the ensuing misery uh, of the troops. Quote, the troops suffered from the adversity of being crowded together. The lack of straw and other indispensable things caused the soldier to suffer extraordinarily. Not one tenth of the most pressing needs of, his, of this army could be met by the villages near the camp." Unquote. Each soldier entered Bohemia carrying a three-day supply of bread 
after which the regimental bread wagons were scheduled to arrive. The soldiers finished their bread on the third day after crossing the frontier into Bohemia, but the bread wagons remained too far in the rear. Schmettau claims that the soldiers were, quote, driven by misery and despair to commit debauchery and looting, all of, went, all of which went unpublished. And this is right at the start of the campaign already. Frederick led the army across the Bohemian frontier to a camp at Velsdorf. According to the Prussian Journal of Operations, the Velsdorf camp stood so close to the Austrian entrenchments that, quote, no hour passed without the outposts exchanging fire, unquote. Frederick maintained his position, this position for 37 days, while the Austrians continued to fortify the western bank of the Upper Elba, thus blocking his path forward. The longer Frederick remained in his position, the more hunger became a greater threat than the Austrians. The West Prussian lieutenant describes his regiment's 11 days at Velsdorf as, quote, a sad time. We ran out of everything on the second day. Not only did we suffer from a lack of food, but also from tobacco, brandy, salt, water, and even straw. Soon our poor men were no longer recognizable. All joyful courage, all cheeriness faded away. Only complaints were heard. The same men who were previously inspired by enthusiasm and courage now let their heads hang and started to become reluctant. Everyone still wanted a battle, but not out of thirst for action, but out of despair. Initially, the officers managed to hold the men together and there was little talk of desertion. But after the shortages increased daily, it became known in the camp how well the Austrians lived, who were barely a mile from us, and how everything was in abundance there. This started, uh, this caused people to start to run away. After this started, there were more and more desertions every day. And unquote, and now Schmettau adds, Mike, I'm area, sorry, you have a couple more minutes. You have okay. one minute or so left. Okay, sorry about that. The, the areas for two miles around the camp offer nothing but terrible devastation, bemoaned Schmettau. In, uh, in short, it was a terrible sight, which tore out the hearts of the officers, for they could not stop this cruel mischief, the door of which had been opened by the king's bad temper. So Schmetter describes uh, the situation at Frederick's headquarters. Even at headquarters, a large part of the houses were demolished and destroyed to keep the army supplied with firewood. A devastation is all more unforgivable because it was not the result of the lack of wood. The camp was surrounded by forests and shrubs. The soldiers spared nothing. Everything was prey to his greed. And when the 20 times plundered, now empty homes of his prey no longer offered him anything, he tore them down and destroyed them. He destroyed everything, even the farm equipment. He broke into the noble manors and treated them the same way. What cannot be taken away was smashed and kicked. If one considered that strict discipline is the basis and the excellence of the Prussian service, which the obedience and strength of our troops is based on, which distinguishes them above all others, in which they ultimately give unlimited submission to the will of the commanding general, so sad and humiliating is the contrast that we have just mentioned. After five weeks at Velsdor, Frederick finally decided to implement the plan to turn Joseph's strategic left by marching some 25 miles northeast to force the passage of the Elba. That his army had completely stripped the area of all foodstuffs in such a wasteful manner contributed to this decision. By 7 September, Frederick had a sick list of 12,000 men. He had no stomach to suffer further losses, and he certainly didn't want to attempt to uh, make a suicide, suicidal attempt to cross the Elba under the guns of the Austrian fortifications. With all the villages in the area exhausted by constant foraging, he decided to withdraw, not merely from his position, but from Bohemia altogether. Frederick established a camp in and around Wild Shoots where he remained from the 9th to the 13th of September. Nature worked against him as well as the worsening weather that signaled the end of the campaigning season. The army had already consumed all the food and forage in the area and the topography of the region made deliveries from Silesia next to impossible. The disease ravaged the poor fed and ill clad troops. Most of the draft and artillery horses and a significant portion of the cavalry's horses were dead. Okay, just to wrap this up, Christopher Duffy finds a military character to be the culprit of the Prussian failure in 1778. Quote, it was only too evident that every branch of Frederick's army was in a state of decline, he concludes. The whole army was unresponsive, unquote. While the performance of the army in the Varian War certainly marked a decline in the proficiency displayed during the Seven Years' War, the fact remains that Frederick had failed in his efforts to rebuild it after that conflict. 
While decay could be found in all the Army's branches and departments, its daily operations in 1778 indicate that none had more flaws in the officer corps. Stronger leadership, the type man mandated in the Army's manuals from officers of all grades could have accomplished much in correcting the behavior of the junior officers, the NCOs, and ultimately the privates. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike, for a fascinating uh, uh, expose of the difficulties of uh, being on campaign. Uh, not much mention of potatoes, I was sad to hear, but uh, it was uh, never, nevertheless, clearly uh, foraging was principal part of your, of your talk. And thank you very much for that. Very much, very much enjoyed that. Um, we're now going to move on to Ethan Sifji. Ethan Sifji is a doctoral student at the University of North Texas. He's working under Mike Legere's direction. Uh, last year, he defended his MA thesis, which was entitled Testing the Narrative of Prussian Decline, 1778 to 1806, uh, which calls for reassessment of the Prussian performance during the French Revolutionary Wars. He's going to talk to us now, hopefully for 20 minutes, uh, on uh, Prussian conception of a national army in 1806. Thank you very much, Ethan. Thank you, and thank you to Dr. Mikabritza for this opportunity. Um, my paper is titled The Prussian Conceptions of the National Army Before 1806. On October 14th, 1806, the Prussian army, long considered Europe's best, collided with Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte's Grand Armée at the Twin Battle of Vienna and Auerstadt. During these engagements, Prussia suffered one of the worst military disasters in modern history. In a single day, the Prussian army effectively ceased to exist as a fighting force. The following year, Napoleon forced Prussian King Frederick William III to accept a peace that reduced Prussia to a third-rate subordinate ally. This humil humiliation forced the Prussians to examine their performance and find the reasons for their defeat. Over the next six years, a group of Prussian officers led by Gerhard von Scharnhorst attempted to reform the Prussian army and state at almost every level in order to liberate Prussia from Napoleon's control. They increased the army's light infantry, introduced a new general staff system, adopted combined arms corps, and sought to raise a national army along the French model. Not all of these reforms were fully implemented. However, Prussia fielded a powerful modern army in 1813 that proved vital in driving Napoleon from Germany. The story of Prussia's defeat and subsequent reform has dominated the historiography of Napoleonic Prussia. While Napoleon has received the vast majority of historical attention, those who have written on Prussia have focused on the Prussian reform movement or their campaigns against Napoleon. Prussian historians have largely focused on the reform movement after the Battle of Jena, only superficially addressing the pre-Jena period. Yet all of the reforms that the Prussians implemented between 1807 and 1813 had been discussed or suggested before the Jena campaign. Men such as Scharnhorst, August Nadehard von Gneisenhau and Hermann von Boyen believed that the French Revolution had transformed warfare. On the tactical level, the French had employed large numbers of skirmishers and often deployed their line troops to skirmish. In addition, the French frequently discarded the old linear formations of 18th century warfare for highly mobile assault columns. On the operational level, the French introduced combined arms divisions that granted them far greater strategic and operational flexibility. On the strategic level, the French sought to destroy their enemies in battle rather than defeat them through maneuver. Finally, the French fielded a national army of citizen soldiers rather than a professional army. This allowed them to field much larger armies than previously possible and to trust their troops to live off the land without deserting. In addition, the French army abolished corporal punishment during the revolution. The Prussian reformers assumed that these changes were connected that the military improvements could not be adopted without social reforms. They believed that fighting in the French style with light infantry required a citizen army, and that such an army required a liberalization of discipline. Given the size restrictions placed on the Prussian army after the Jena campaign, the Landwehr proved to be one of the most important measures of the reform movement. While the Landwehr did not, crisp, the form of the Landwehr did not crystallize into the outbreak of war in 1813, Ideas for some sort of national army based on universal service existed in Prussia before the 1806 campaign. Yet this idea proved to be one of the most controversial proposed by the reformers. More conservative officers, and to some extent Frederick William III, mistrusted the common subject's loyalty and capability. 
They worried that creating a nation in arms similar to the French would upset the social order and threaten the position of the king and nobility within it. These men feared that arming the people en masse would make them political actors and entitle them to some role in government. Other officers doubted the military value of a militia. They claimed that they would lack adequate training, discipline, and morale. In addition, they worried that such a force, if combined with the regular army, would undermine the army's combat effectiveness. However, even less reform-minded officers such as these proposed the idea of a militia as a method to solve manpower shortages caused by the army's need to pacify the new Polish territories. Nevertheless, these proposals all failed to gain general support within the army or to win over the king. Throughout Prussia, many conservatives opposed the idea of a national army or significant reliance on a militia. They feared it would disrupt the social order of Prussia. The Prussian nobility, known as Junkers in the East Elbian regions, dominated Prussian politics and society. Controlling 60% of all Prussian lands, the nobility possessed a much higher proportion of property than their counterparts in most other European countries. By contrast, the French nobility owned approximately 20% of the land in France. This meant that the Junkers dominated the overwhelmingly agrarian Prussian economy and society. Service as officers in the Prussian army created much of the Junkers' sense of identity. By the time of the death of Frederick II in 1789, uh, 1787, sorry, the nobility had become inseparable from the officer corps. The Junker class derived much of its sense of honor from its role in the military. By extension, many Junkers believed that only nobles could possess a sense of honor and duty. Therefore, Conservatives believed that Prussian peasants could only become reliable soldiers through the army's harsh training and strict discipline. Hence, the king and many traditionalist officers doubted the political reliability of a militia, national army, or any form of universal conscription. Few essays submitted to the Military Society of Berlin openly debate the idea of a national army or militia. However, some do discuss concepts critical for the reformers' dream of a nation in arms. In an essay on the importance of maintaining military spirit of a standing army, Captain Friedrich von Reichenstein examines the ideas of discipline, honor, and rewards. Reichenstein argues that the martial spirit of a population is critical to any military power. Citing the examples of ancient Greece and Rome, he claims that if any military, if the military virtue of the people declines, then the state will fail regardless of its organization or doctrine. Ironically for the writer of a military essay, he claims that writings on military theory are unnecessary for a great army and a sign of a people's martial deterioration. He points to the increased theoretical writings in France after the Seven Years' War as proof of this phenomenon. He asserts that the key to maintaining a proper military spirit are discipline, subordination, and proper motivation. He claims that discipline must be adequate to determine a soldier from repeating an offense and make him an example to his comrades. In effect, Reichenstein defends the Prussian army's harsh discipline. In addressing subordination, he supports the inherent, he supports the um, ideas of hierarchy and moral authority for the officer corps. Because of their positions in society and education, aristocrats naturally possess the moral authority to lead in battle. However, in discussing motivation, Reichenstein undermines the traditionalist view of the common soldier. He argues that the martial spirit of the common people is critical to the success of an army. More importantly, he claims that rewards are just as important as punishments to the motivation of soldiers. He advocates for a number of different rewards, such as financial gifts or lands to farm upon retirement. Reichenstein also proposes that medals and awards could create a sense of pride among the rank and file. This idea was a fairly significant change to the Junkers understanding of the common Prussian subjects because it assumed they had a sense of honor. Most Junker officials believed that only nobles could have honor and therefore only they could be motivated by military commendations. Reichenstein's essay contends that ordinary men could have their own sense of honor and thus could, and that it could compel them to fight and sacrifice for the state. On the larger scale, Reichenstein argues that identifying the Prussian state and king as the protector of the people's privileges and prosperity would help create a military spirit among the commoners. His wording suggests that he believes the Prussian government was already protecting the interests of the common people and that merely a change in rhetoric could achieve this effect. However, the idea that commoners had a stake in the state was radical. It undermined the typical Junker view of the Prussian social order and threatened their privileged position within it. While Reichenstein's suggestions aimed to maintain the Prussian standing army, his proposals on motivation mirror the measures that the reformers believed necessary to create a national army or militia. They believed that the old methods of military discipline were unsuited for a national army and that new rewards and punishments were necessary to motivate such a force. 
While the idea of a national army existed in Prussia before 1806, most Prussian officers were he hesitant to advocate for it openly or in print. However, writers outside the Prussian army or Prussia itself could write with a far greater degree of freedom from Prussia's censorship or fear of being labeled Jacobin. The most famous such writer was the former Prussian officer Heydrich Diedrich von Bülow. In response to Napoleon's June 14, 1800 victory at the Battle of Marengo, Bülow argued that modern warfare had fundamentally changed. He claimed that the French Revolution had reinvigorated the peoples of Europe, causing them to become a political force. He reasoned that during the re this revolutionary struggle, the French harnessed the military potential of their population, allowing them to defeat their enemies. Bülow asserted that this new kind of war was a war of nations and that only states that could draw fully on the potential of their population could survive these modern struggles. Some form of national army along the French model was the only viable army for the future. While manpower represented one reason for this, Bülow also argued that the tactics of modern war required a citizen army. In his opinion, all infantry should fight in open order as skirmishers. These tactics required more initiative and freedom than Frederican armies prevented, permitted their soldiers and he concluded that only an army of free citizen soldiers accustomed to independent thought and action could successfully fight in this style. While other military thinkers believed in the value of a national army, Bülow's ideas were far more extreme than most of his contemporaries. He viewed the armies of the Frederican age as completely obsolete, and this view was far too radical for most thinkers at his time, even the reformers. Yet some, such as Scharnhorst, agreed with him about many of the advantages of a national army. Scharnhorst, Reichenstein, and Major Christian von Massenbach, all of whom fought in the War of the First Coalition, claimed that the French citizenry had greatly aided France's war efforts. In his works, Bülow raised another aspect of, French, of the National Army that most Prussian officers avoided debating before 1806. The reformers assumed that to create a national army, the Prussians would also have to adopt social reforms. Namely, the serfs, who form the bulk of the rank and file, must have some stake in the state. Many argued that to form a national army, the king would be forced to adopt a constitution that turned his soldiers into citizens with rights and privileges rather than mere subjects. Other military writers outside Prussia echoed many of these themes. In his Neues Militarisch Magazine, the Saxony Lieutenant Johann Friedrich Hoya argued that German states could adopt the same military system as the French. Like Reichenstein and Bülow, Hoya insisted that citizens must believe their interests were aligned with those of the state. In this regard, he focused much of his attention on the importance of citizens as light infantry. The Saxon agreed with Bülow about the importance of skirmishers and argued that German citizen soldiers could be just as effective as French light troops. Similar to Bülow, he asserted that citizen soldiers were better suited for skirmishing than professional Frederican soldiers. He ar his arguments about punishments and rewards resembled those of Reichenstein, especially regarding honor and duty. He too believed that Germans could motivate their commoners by appealing to their sense of honor. In addition, he supported the idea that men who believed they had a stake in the state would have far better morale than those who fought merely for pay. The ideas of Reichenstein, Bülow, and Hoyer did not represent a concrete proposal for a national army or even explicitly discuss it, yet their writings demonstrate the necessary concepts to create a national army of citizen soldiers. Although the topic of a national army received far less attention in print than the debate surrounding light infantry or combined arms divisions, a number of officers presented plans to their superiors privately. The most important of these plans was presented by Karl Frederick von Kessenbeck. Submitted in 1803, he drafted a plan to transform the traditional Prussian canton system into a model of true universal service. The canton system regulated the army's conscriptions during the majority of the 18th century. Each regiment was assigned a specific district or canton from which to recruit or conscript manpower. All men of military age were required to attend military training in the spring of every third year. Following the exercises, the regimental commander could conscript any man he felt he needed to fill his ranks. In theory, this gave the Prussian army a large pool of trained reserves from which to draw replacements. More importantly, it established military duty as the responsibility of all subjects. However, so many ex exemptions existed that only the poorest serfs were actually subject to conscription. In addition, Prussian rulers disliked drawing too many productive subjects into the army. Therefore, after the Seven Years' War, Frederick the Great relied more on foreigners than natives to comprise the bulk of his army. Consequently, by the end of the 18th century, the Canton system was little more than an administrative device. In his proposal, 
Kessenbeck defended the idea of a national militia and the value of universal service. He argued that the Prussian army already represented a citizen militia in which only a part of the populace had to serve. The first part of his plan demanded the removal of all exemptions from the Canton system. According to Kessenbeck, after the spring training, all men should be sorted into three groups, those fit for the standing army, those in critical war industry or agriculture and um, who would form the Fatherland Reserve, and the unfit or old soldier who would create the Honor Legion. Each year, the regular army would discharge 128,000 men and replace them with men from the first group. These men would train with the army for six weeks during the spring period, then be released back into the Fatherland Reserve for more drill. In event of war, the Fatherland Reserve would serve as a true reserve, reinforcing field forces and supplying trained cadres. Kassenbeck based his plan on the notion that war was a matter of national concern affecting the entire population. This idea changed the 18th century concept of war as simply a contest between kings. In his view, the state was, in this view, the state was the concern of the king and his advisors and the common people had no interest in the outcome of wars. However, Kessenbeck's system assumed that war affected the entire nation. Therefore, everyone should contribute to the war effort. This also implied that the common people were citizens as well as subjects. Kessenbeck adopted the, the classical view that all citizens had a duty to serve in time of war. However, unlike many reformers, he suggested that no changes to the discipline of the Prussian army were necessary or social order. While Kessenbeck sympathized with the reformers, he seemed to think that a national army could be created without altering current Prussian military practice. This set him apart both from other reformers and conservatives who believed that a national army would require a new social order. After receiving Kessenbeck's proposal, the king presented it to the Emergency Commission for Military Organization on July 20. 5th, 1803. The commission considered the plan for three weeks and then rejected it for a number of reasons. Many of the commissioners feared that special interest groups would prevent the elimination of all exemptions. Others argued that the Fatherland Reserve would uh, dilute the replacements for the regular army. In addition, they doubted that six weeks of training could shape untrained men into effective soldiers and believed that they would only be valuable for garrison duty. Finally, the commission thought that Kessenbeck's plan to increase the natural patriotism of Prussia threatened Prussia's social order. According to the commissioners, undermining traditional, traditional provincial loyalties would undermine the basis of the army and Prussian state. In 1806, in 1806 Scharnhorst submitted his own plan for a national militia. He argued that the Prussians would soon be in a desperate struggle with France that would threaten Prussia's very existence. Prussia could not match France's financial resources or population, nor did they possess the geographical defenses to offset this disadvantage. To respond to this threat, Scharnhorst suggested strengthening the regular army by 25,000 men. However, he also asserted that a national militia was critical to Prussian survival. Scharnhorst envisioned a militia consisting of Prussians from all classes and provinces that would operate separately from the standing army. Based on the example of Hanover during the Seven Years' War, he believed that Prussia could raise a national militia of 300,000 men. This militia would help the Prussian army meet its manpower requirements. Yet more importantly to Scharnhorst, the militia would give Prussia the moral power of a nation fighting for its existence. He argued that raising a national militia was necessary to transform any conflict with France into a national war. In addition, he claimed that Prussia was uniquely suited to raise an affected militia because the kingdom contained a large number of patriotic citizens of every class. Moreover, he asserted that these citizens possessed a sense of duty to the nation and military honor. Finally, he argued that a large number of former soldiers in Prussia would make training and disciplining a militia far easier than in other states. Scharnhorst submitted his plan to the Duke of Brunswick and the King's uh, Adjutant General Friedrich von Kleist. However, they ignored Scharnhorst's proposal and it is unclear if they ever presented it to the King. Scharnhorst's assessment of the Prussian position in this proposal is fairly pessimistic, although prescient. He implied that the Prussian army, as it existed in 1806, could not match the French army. Part of these doubts related to manpower concerns. He believed that the Prussians would be outnumbered in any clash with the French. Nathan, I'm sorry, you have one minute left, OK? OK. Thank you. Um, he basically argued that the French uh, advantage in the War of the First Coalition proved that a nation fighting for its survival would cause the nation to fight far more fiercely and be far more committed to the war. Uh, one other proposal was made by Major Christian von Massenbach in many of his works. These proposals basically follow the same arguments and the same logic as Scharnhorst. He makes the same arguments about the war of the first coalition and the virtues of a national army. 
These writings and proposals demonstrate that the reform-minded Prussians shared a similar conception of a national army before 1806. They understood that some form of universal service to be essential to a standing army. Such measures were necessary to meet the increased manpower needs of Prussia and to match the French numbers. They also believed that a nation in arms would enhance the morale of the regular army. They envisioned this army consisting of all social classes, but mostly containing men from the peasantry. In addition, this would give the Prussians the moral advantage of a nation uh, fighting a national war, and they believed that this would bolster the state's commitment to war. The reformers assumed that the Prussian people already possessed or could easily acquire the patriotism necessary to create such a force. Um, they believed that to do this, the Prussian state had to convince these men that their interests were tied with those of the state and appeal to their sense of honor and duty by uh, repealing harsh punishments such as flogging and motivating soldiers with rewards. Others argued that modern tactics such as increased numbers of skirmishers required an army of this type. The only major disagreement about universal service among the reformers was whether men should be integrated into the standing army or serve as a national militia separate for the regular army. Regardless, the ideas of the reformers concerning a national army before 1806 remain fairly consistent. This vision of a national army solidified in Prussia before the disaster at Jena, not in response to it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ethan, for that. I'm sorry to force you to drive to a quick conclusion, but uh, I, usually the questions at the end are delightful and, uh, and I'm sure you will be delighted to respond to some of the questions that we've already had in regarding what you've just presented. Um, so we move swiftly on so that no wasting no more time to the uh, uh, pr presentation by Vanya Eftimova Bellinger. She's an author and assistant professor of strategy and security studies at the Air University's E School of Graduate Professional Military Education Air Command, and Air Command and Staff College of the US Air Force. In 2015, she published her first book, Marie von Clausewitz, The Woman Behind the Making of On War, Oxford University Press USA. And she won the Society for Military History's Moncado Prize for her article, The Other Clausewitz, finding from, Findings from the Newly Discovered Correspondence Between Marie and Karl von Clausewitz. Um, she's going to talk to us this evening about Karl von Clausewitz. Was he the father of the Prussian land bear? Thank you very much, Vanya. We look very much forward to hearing what you've got to say. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm kind of wrapping up the discussion, what you heard before that, uh, about the um, changes in the Prussian army. So if you're a reader of On War or Clausewitz enthusiast, you might be forgiven if you're puzzled what role Clausewitz played in the creation of the Landwehr or the provincial, provincial militia in early 1813 in the Renegade province of East Prussia. This might be, in fact, the first time you're hearing about this. Peter Pore's biography, which is considered the standard biography on Clausewitz, barely mentions uh, Clausewitz drafting the measures. Uh, more recently, Donald Stoker's book cites um, Ernst Moritz Arndt uh, praise for Clausewitz efforts, but doesn't provide in-depth discussion what were those measures. And my own biography of Marie von Clausewitz, now it's time for some self-flagellation, is primarily interested in the personal dynamic between Alexander von Don Donna and Clausewitz, considering that Donna was once candidate for Marie's hand and an object uh, of Clausewitz's jealousy. In recent years, especially in the light of the global war on terror, Clausewitz's understanding of small wars and people's war um, enjoys significant scholarly attention. Nevertheless, uh, Christopher Dazi and uh, James Davis' recent translation of Clausewitz's lectures on small war omits the draft from early 1813 in terms of time frame and concepts closely um, connected with the lectures. Even Sibyl Scheiper's excellent monograph on small wars, arguing about the centrality of Clausewitz's concept of people's war, small wars, and landwehr in his thought overlooks his role in the landwehr measures uh, from early 1813. In contrast, uh, for most of the 19th century and the first part of the 20th century, Clausewitz's actions in Königsberg were, the, uh, were an object of passionate debates. Yet most authors associated Clausewitz's role with the larger influence of his mentor, Gerhard von Scharnhorst, 
Hermann von Boyen, but most notably uh, the historian Max Lehmann cited um, Clausewitz's measures as a clear evidence that Scharnhorst was indeed the father of the Prussian Landwehr. Clausewitz was his favorite student, as we know. In this interpretation, Clausewitz simply channeled earlier ideas developed under Schanhorst's guidance, and Schanhorst's um, supposed later criticism of these Prussian measures was actually a discussion about how to transfer and implement them on a larger scale. I will analyze uh, Clausewitz's draft within the reform circles larger uh, intellectual framework, of course, but my main focus is on the text place within the Clausewitz oeuvre. I argue that Clausewitz's efforts were crucial in the creation of the Prussian Landwehr. Equally, uh, his draft from early 1813 provides us with insight about his concept of people's war and therefore deserves a prominent place in his legacy. Now, to give you a little bit historic background, and I'm um, using very broad strokes here. Um, so in the light of Napoleon's defeat in Russia, um, the allied Prussian corps under Gen uh, General uh, Ludwig York von Wartenburg um, charged with blocking the Russian uh, advance and protecting the French retreat, signed on December 30th, 1812, the Convention of Torgen. On the Russian side, the act was negotiated by none, none other but Karl von Clausewitz, since his resignation from the Prussian army in April 1812, serving in Russian uniform. By signing the um, Convention of Taurogen, York neutralized his 14,000 men, retreated east of Vistua, and allowed the, the Russian army to cross into the province of East Prussia, ther therefore transferring the theater of war to Central Europe. In early 1813, the former Prussian minister Baron von Stein arrived in Königsberg and effectively took control over the province as a plenipotentiary of the Russian emperor. Uh, East Prussia, and to uh, keep the things apart, East Prussia is the province. It's a little bit more complicated, but East Pr Prussia is the province, Prussia is the kingdom. So East Prussia, the province, was the theater of war in the, uh, in the winter of 1807. Hence, the possibility of repeating this sad fate was on everyone's mind. Uh, Stein called the estates in the local diet, that's the land tag, and urged them to adopt measures for the province self-protection. Count Alexander von Dona, a member of one of East Prussia's most illustrious families and a former deputy of Stein, was tasked uh, with presiding over the matters. Stein suggested that Donna still consult the Prussian officers in Russian service now residing in Königsberg since they had gained valuable experience in the 1812 campaign. Clausewitz was the most accomplished by them as his success uh, in Tauro again demonstrated. Also sometime around 1808, he had become um, interested in people's war as his letter to Fichte and his study of the revolt in Vendi revealed. The reform circle famously prepared plans for national uprising against Napoleon, which Frederick, Frederick Wilhelm III rejected. Associated with these plans, Scharnhorst drafted a document calling for, for the creation of provincial troops. More on that later. Uh, 1810, Scharnhorst also appointed Clausewitz as an instructor for small wars at the Kriegs Academy. That was a course that um, Scharnhorst originally taught, but now he gave it to Clausewitz. Sibyl Scheipers um, suggests that by being forced to study the subject in a methodical and comprehensive manner, Clausewitz also fused significant new development, and that's ideology and politics, into the otherwise largely tactical discipline. To remind you, throughout the 18th century, small wars were irregular tactics performed by small uh, regular units, part of the regular army. Clausewitz's expertise in the subject of irregular warfare and uh, its politicization was revealed by his three Bekenntnisse or statements written shortly before his departure for Russia in 1812 and on outlining a plan for resistance against Napoleon. Among the Prussian officers in Russian uniform to whom Donna turned, Clausewitz therefore was the obvious 
choice. So let's turn to the draft itself. The title, Das Wesentliche in der Organisation eines Landsturm und einer Miliz, Landwehr, or the fundamental requirements for organ organizing a Landsturm and a Militia Landwehr in parentheses, suggests that Clausewitz sketched out the tenets he considered critical for the creation of the force. The text, therefore, was a blueprint. He, as an expert on the subject, provided to the local authorities to build upon and adjust based on the conditions. The text is short. Its printed version amounts to mere two pages. Another important point um, is that throughout the text, Clausewitz made direct references to his experience in the 1812 campaign. The final version edited by Donna somewhat obscured this detail. Additionally, when describing the integration of the Landwehr uh, battalions into regular uh, regiments, Clausewitz actually referred to the experience of the Wittgenstein Corps to which um, he belonged. It is an interesting detail requiring further exploration that I did not have time to do, and that is how um, the Wittgenstein was organized and considering the direct reference, whether these measures can be traced back to Clausewitz's influence. Um, for Clausewitz in the document first discussed the Landsturm. Landsturm included to quote Clausewitz all inhabitants between the ages of 18 and 60 who can carry weapons. Um, and the later could be ev almost everything, pikes, signs, axes, swords, swords, whatever they had. Um, organized in informal bands on territorial principle, um, the, principle, uh, the purpose of the land, uh, Landsturm, sorry, was to deny the enemy's intrusion deep into the land. By being in informal organization, the Landsturm could attack whenever the enemy was weak or small in numbers. Ideally, the Landsturm restricted the enemy's movements to a small corridor along the lines of its communications. Subsequently, Clausewitz turned to the Landwehr or the militia, and I should say he used the two terms interchangeably in the text. To quote Clausewitz, the youngest bunch from the whole country without differences in status belongs to the militia. All men between the ages of 18 and 40 had to be registered, but whether they would be drafted depended on how many, uh, how many were actually needed the Landwehr had to supplement and strengthen the regular army, especially when the latter suffered defeat and casualties. The Landwehr was tasked with province uh, defense and uh, was equipped and paid by it. It was divided in brigades where three to four battalions made an, a brigade, uh, but this organization was mostly for accountability purposes. In war, every regular infantry uh, regiment received one Landwehr battalion. In this measure, is, this is where Clausewitz uh, referenced the experience, the experience of the Wittgenstein Corps. Its officers had to be men from the Landwehr ranks, possibly such who were veterans. Clausewitz promised to write a special chapter on their commissioning, but no such paragraph actually exists in the manuscript. He also rejected the idea of Landwehr cavalry as too expensive and taking too many valuable resources. Another important point was the creation of military commissions working on behalf of the Landwehr. These local institutions um, uh, were overseen by uh, higher special commissions and the latter, its members were voted by the provincial Landtag. Now, what was in Donna's proposal? Um, the draft Alexander von Donner offered to the provincial diet on February 7th adopted the majority of Clausewitz measures. Uh, frequ actually frequently copying and pasting whole sentences. It expanded on the original text and doubled uh, its content to four pages. Um, the most important differences included the uh, entire part on Landsturm was removed. Um, it was considered too ra radical for the land tax taste. Uh, Donna, Donna's uh, proposal abandoned the idea of universal service. Um, there were various exemptions for um, ex exemptions and options for finding substitutes. 
again, to accommodate the conservative land tax. Um, the age bracket was uh, for the land veil was 1845. Clausewitz's idea about commissions overseeing the draft and armament of the land veil was significantly expanded. It's actually one of the four pages of, in, in uh, Donna's uh, document. And um, now you can understand there were added layers of bureaucracy above, above layers of bureaucracy. The commissions, um, these commissions also chose senior officers and approved units proposals for the junior ranks, NCOs were chosen by, by the company commanders. And then there is a significant part on training and exercise that was added, Clausewitz somehow did not pay attention to that. Um, to this proposal, Baron von Stein added a few lighter revisions, followed by input from other members of the local government. But the, then the edict was accepted and voted by the provincial diet, and Alexander von Dona sent a copy to the Prussian king and the government now presiding in Breslau. The document's perception, especially by the military reformers gathered around Schanhoff, he's now in Breslau, was equivocal. In the 19th century, the supposed rejection fueled the argument that Schanhorst was not the father of the Prussian Landwehr, but the Landwehr was a genuine expression of the people's will. And as Schanhorst biographer Max Lehmann revealed, and Ethan talked about that Schanhorst has worked on um, no less than seven projects on universal service, both before 1806, but most of them are after 1806. Chan Ho's main idea circled around universal service where the inhabitants would be drafted to, to two main venues, regular army and provincial troops, that's Chan Ho's term. Uh, the latter troops were mobilized in support of the standing army, but equipped by the provinces. As a mid-sized state, and especially since it's defeat by Napoleon in 1806, uh, Prussia could not afford a large standing army. And you can see also the similarities to the project Clausewitz uh, uh, drafted in Königsberg in 1813. The deviations in this Prussian edict, um, however, ran against many of Shanho's core principles. From witness statements, we know that the issues raised were universal service, the military commissions, and the Landwehr cavalry as crucial for the uh, war effort. Nonetheless, for everyone in Breslau, the, um, the fast, largely problem-free and enthusiastic passage of the Landwehr edict in East Prussia was a mon monumental event, a deal breaker. Since the beginning of 1813, Scharnhorst was again working in secret on project for national mobilization, but he envisioned a difficult path for its passage. The event in Königsberg took the Prussian government by surprise and demonstrated that the measures enjoyed a, a tangible support. The Landwehr Gazette for the whole nation was passed on March 17th, a uh, little over a month after the East Prussian edict. If we compare the national law with the edict from Königsberg, there are some significant differences. In the national law, the Landwehr included men between uh, 17 and 40, not serving in a regular army. Um, 1845 was in the pre provincial edict. Um, the Landwehr would serve beyond the province borders. The service was universal. The Landwehr cavalry was created too. Um, the national law adopted, however, important parts from the provincial project, most notably the, the military commissions responsible for the recruitment. The military commissions selected officers to be confirmed by the king later. The king also selected battalion commanders and above. The land there was divi uh, divided in battalions and brigades, but um, later integrated in the regular units, although not in the strict format, one battalion to a, a regular regiment, the establishment of the Landsturm was included too. To wrap things up, three important points from Clausewitz's original draft were accepted in the national law. The military committees, um, the oversight of the local, local diet over the Landwehr, and the Landwehr structure and integration within the regular army. So, 
to go to the conclusions. Should we then call Clausewitz the father of the Prussian Landwehr? I would argue this would be an exaggeration. Nonetheless, Clausewitz's contributions were unique and far-reaching. The Landwehr had many fathers, yet Clausewitz's image as a mere vehicle of Scharnhorst's ideas proliferated by historians is inaccurate. Clausewitz's fundamental requirements were clear, meticulous, and practical. They allowed Alexander von Donner to create a document understandable and acceptable to the local diet. Without the East Prussian land there, the national mobilization would still have happened, but it would have had a significantly difficult and probably prolonged birth. How should we appraise the text within the framework of Clausewitz's thought? The military commissions and the Diet's oversight over the land where reveal Clausewitz's belief in the politics supremacy over the military, and that's pretty early in his career. Having a local representatives administering um, the national mobilization was one of the one of his fundamental requirements. We also to we ought to admit to the central role the lunch to played in his thought. That is the informal units, unit, uh, units using irregular warfare to harass the enemy and deny its access to resources and te territory. Landsturm opened Clausewitz's fundamental requirements in 1813. Landsturm was a key element in his plan for resistance against Napoleon as expressed in the Bekenntnisse. Uh, from 1812. Landsturm, if you consider, is actually what is Clausewitz talking about in his chapter on people's war in, in on war. Clausewitz's lectures on small wars have received, have recently enjoyed scholarly attention. I argue that the Landsturm deserves similar exploration, if not the central place when we discuss Clausewitz's concept of people's war. Additionally, today, Clausewitz enjoys a fame because of his contributions in the field of military theory. He is overlooked as a practitioner of war. However, in early 1813, his ability to pack innovative concepts in a set of practical solutions was crucial for the Prussian war effort. Clausewitz's actions in 1813 confirmed his belief that realistic war theory does make a difference on the battlefield. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Vanya, for your positively Prussian uh, respect for the time allowed. Fantastic. You make me a happy man. Um, I would like to bring, we'll start as for the questions. I think what we should do, uh, we'll start with, um, I think, why not let's go with Vanya first of all. We have a question from Rick Schneid who asks, was there any indication that Clausewitz reflected upon the Austrian employment of the Landwehr in the 1809 campaign? Any indication that Scharnhorst or others looked at the Austrian Landwehr experience? Um, I think Scharnhorst has, um, I, I, I don't believe the Clausewitz, uh, let me reverse that. <laughs> uh, we know that, and it's, I should say, I'm just in the beginning of this exploration. And why I said, let me um, reverse that, because we, we don't actually know many of these pieces, how these pieces work. And we know that 1809 Clausewitz, as much as he derided intelligence, uh, the role of intelligence and so on, this is what actually 1809 he does in the, in the Prussian headquarters, is that he um, looks um, at the, um, at, what is happening, you know, on the Austrian side, and he reports on that. So um, yes, um, most likely there was some influence, but I cannot talk to to exact influence. Um, early uh, uh, Shanhorst early concepts of um, Landwehr and so on they actually go actually the British uh, the British militia. Um, they actually are built upon the the British militia which I find interesting because we will expect that it's actually uh, on the other, he's looking on the other side. Thank you very much. And thank you for that, that answer. Dan Messman of the University of North Texas would like to ask you, how do you think Clausewitz's role in 1813 
uh, a field officer helping essentially strong arm his country into war shaped his thinking about the role of the military in the political dimensions of war. <laughs> oh God, that was a very um, small question. Small question. Just uh, take your time. Very, uh, take your time <laughs> um, who's the government? I mean, yes, we see um, we see the difference here. We see that Clausewitz um, it's the is the king. He's going against the king, but um, he's supporting the yeah. That's. Um, it gives us a very more, a much more complex, the, the, there is so much more complexity to Clausewitz thinking about what is government, what is the role of the people, what is the role of the military. Um, it's, like I said, I'm in the beginning of this project um, and uh, we see, um, the the layers upon layers upon layers that we can we can explore definitely we understand that um uh clausewitz it's there in a system these things they constantly uh the the political side and the military side um they're in constant interaction thank you very much so we will now you're you're off the hot seat now vanya you can relax and have a drink uh, now, uh, Ethan, it's your turn in the uh, in the cell, um, in the in the barrel, I think is what they say, isn't it? Uh, right. Uh, no, this is a question from Ramsey Hardin. How did Davu manage to gain such an overwhelming victory at Auerstadt despite being significantly outnumbered? Was this defeat down to bad leadership or the Prussian army not carrying out necessary reforms? Um probably both. Uh, the definitely bad leadership is there at Auerstadt. Um, they also, they had started some reforms, like the general staff system had come into play before the 1806 campaign, but it was kind of too late. It, it was, I believe, implemented in 1806 or 1805. There wasn't really time for them to get through, and the reforms weren't, to a certain extent, they still had a lot of sort of questionable old officers. So they had reformed somewhat, but clearly not enough. So yes, it is basically both. Okay, thank you very much. Delightful, one of the one of the fantastic bits about being here, all of us together, uh, Masena Society worldwide. We have a question from the University of Queensland in Australia, fantastic. David Hilda uh, asks, Ethan, was there any notable political, diplomatic or military action from French forces occupying Prussia during Scharnhorst's reforms. Did the French administration have a contingency plan to retain French gains and keep the Prussian army in a weak state? Um, so I'm presuming you mean the reforms after the Battle of Jena and the uh, French, uh, not quite it's occupation the, of Prussia. I'll ask David Hill to that, but uh, re um, respond but, it. <laughs> yeah, but that, that sounds like it. Um, and the answer is the Napoleon, forced Stein out of, and I think at one point forced Scharnhorst into resigning um, from their uh, positions because their anti-French anti attitude was worrying to him. And they obviously weren't able to execute a lot of their, or start their plans because any mobilization would have been perceived by Napoleon as a threat. Um, before 1806, I don't think he paid too much attention to what the Prussians were doing internally, but definitely afterwards. Okay, just trawling through the questions here. We're, we're coming to you, Mike, How hang in there. Uh, there are several questions for you too. Uh, just one, we have another question from uh, uh, Jacqueline Reiter, who I participated yesterday with in a, in a panel. She was speaking very interestingly about uh, a British admiral. Uh, she questions you, she have a question for Ethan. I was fascinated to hear that the Prussians were discussing issues of martial spirit, citizen armies, national service, as the British were debating similar issues at the same time, which is Vanya obviously mentioned that just now. My question is, was there any awareness in Prussia of what was going on in Britain? admittedly a rather different state, but still a monarchy. For example, the debate over whether citizen soldiers, such as volunteers, had a claim to the franchise, or that in 1806, the Secretary of State Wyndham was considering expanding the franchise to soldiers to encourage them to enlist. Thank you, and sorry for the complicated question, she says. Um, I haven't found it. 
if you, um, when looking through the, uh, the Military Society of Berlin's uh, publications, they have a sort of a literature review thing in the back and they review um, different articles from around the, the, some will be in French, some will be in, some will be in Prussia, some will be in other Germans. I think there might've been one in English if I remember correctly, but I might be misremembering that. There was not a, I didn't find a significant English influence they seem to be more focused on France than England by quite a bit. Um, Vanya, would you like to intervene at that uh, point so on the question I'm, uh, as well? What I'm uh, referring to, um, it's, uh, it's actually in this book, sorry, I have all, all of these things. <laughs> uh, so it's a Sean Horst collected works, which um, USF- Which we all have on our bookshelves, I'm sure. Yeah, uh, USF is very expensive and uh, USF Force was so kind to buy it. And so that's how I'm using God it. Bless the USF. In, in, um, inside, um, th that's why I was so surprised that Sean Horst is referring to the British measures because um, like Ethan said, uh, in other documents, you cannot find it. Like there is nothing, uh, but Sean Horst wrote um, a whole article in 1806, which he did not publish. Um, and that's why, uh, but it's it's uh, preserved in his papers. And it's where he like talks about uh, the Landwehr and so on. And that's where he actually touches upon the, the British. There is a whole section where he discusses the British measures, the, the, the British militia. But um, there is nothing actually um, on, on the other side, you know, on giving them the vote and so on, which we can understand why Sean Hose did not do it because um, he might have thought about it. That might have been his on the back of his mind, uh, but politically that would have been impossible in, in Prussia. And we know that he was, uh, he made the point after 1807 when he became the head of the re um, military reorganization uh, committee that he um, did not give any political opinions. He, um, you know, that he kept his political opinions for himself. He was famous with that. He will say military opinions, but he will keep, you know, most people knew where he, his heart was, but like he made the point not to mention it. Okay, thank you very much for that, Vanya. Uh, my personal um, uh, amusing reminiscence of this question in 1802 when the British were faced with the threat of France. Uh, and thinking about creating um, uh, many, many thousands of men in the militia, the big question was who would they shoot? Uh, mm. And they weren't, they didn't want to give them guns for that very reason. But anyway, they, they, they finally did in the end. But I, I find that a delightful remark. Uh, anyway, we're coming on. I think that's the end of the questions for Ethan, as far as I know. I'm just trawling up here. Uh, oh no, one more for Ethan. How did Bulow's observations differ from Archduke Charles' earlier pronouncements on the changing nature of war in his War Against the New Franks, published in 1795? This is a question from Rick Schneidt. I'm not familiar with Archduke Charles's opinions in that one. I'm more familiar with him in the um, later reform, in his later reforms in the 1809 campaign. So I'm not sure. Interesting, interesting a path of research for you there for very kindly brought to you by the very eminent Dr. Rick Schneid. Um, and uh, I think we're now on to um, Dr. Legere. So uh, well, there were several questions for you. I want to make sure I get them. I'll start them in the right order here. Uh, da -da -da -um. uh, there are, yes, it's quite a lot here. So first question is from John Curtis. Do you think that the reformed Prussian army was the start of the German way of warfare, which had as an aspect violence beyond the norms of warfare? The Prussian army had a hatred of the French not seen in the other armies of the coalitions. French soldiers rightly feared it's being take, taken prisoner by the Prussians, who often killed them after they had surrendered. See the accounts journals of the Prussian military pastor Kurler from 1813 and 14. This aspect of German way of warfare in quotations, continued to 1870, civilian snipers seen everywhere and dealt with accordingly, increased in World War I and reached its ideological genocidal pinnacle in World War II. Big question, uh, what do you do with that, Mike? Microphone, please, Mike, you have to turn yourself on. Thank you. What's the question? Good question. Uh, I'll give it again. Uh, do you think that the reformed Prussian army was the start of the German way of war? Okay, that, 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 that's all we That's need. the question. Uh, 
the reform, well, according to the, the German way of war, um, as defined by Rob Satito, who coined the phrase, it's for short wars. That's what the German way of war is, short war wars. Um, all that other business that the, that the question discusses about hatred and snipers and stuff like that, it's irrelevant. The German okay. way of war is short wars. The reformed Prussian army lays the groundwork for um, the future uh, mastery of operational level warfare that the Prussians show in 1866 and 1870. Um, the Reform Prussian Army shows the uh, the marriage of, of general the general staff with the with the uh, field commanders and and uh, so forth, but um, uh, all that other business. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much for that uh, useful uh, clarification on that point. Uh, John, Jack Gill uh, would like to make an observation, not a question, but so we can just listen to this and enjoy. He enjoys your talk very much, uh, Mike. Reminds uh, one of Lieutenant Karl von Sukhov's recollections, comparing his experience as a Prussian officer in 1806, just before the Battle of Jena, with his time serving under Ney during the invasion of Russia in 1812. And he quotes von Sukhov. If we youths found ourselves extremely uncomfortable on this fateful eve of a major day of the major day of battle, Jena, 1806, how must it have been for these old generals who for so many years had been accustomed to the utmost ease and the greatest comfort? One of these, a friend of my family, had established his quarters in a very finely furnished garden house in the vicinity of the bivouac. I was sent to him in the dark of the night, and as soon as I entered, he called out to me wistfully, Ah, you poor wretch drink a cup of chocolate. This is truly a dog's life." Close quotes. I thought about him a few years later deep in Russia as I saw Marshal Ney in the bivouac at minus 28 degrees cold. Von Sukhov, Aus meinen Soldatenleben 62. Okay, that's thanks very much for that, Jack. Uh, and uh, da -dum, da -dum, da -dum. a question for Mike from Rick Schneid. You described the horrid state of the Prussian army's logistical situation in this war, but wouldn't this reflect poor preparation for war rather than a decline in the officer corps? After all, colonels, captains, and lieutenants are not responsible for army supply problems. Yes, um, the, the larger version of this paper goes into that. Um, and I also point out the, the lessons that were there to be learned about uh, trying to form uh, logistical service while on the march. Um, so un unfortunately, I had to cut that out of the paper. Um, well, what Dr. Snyde says is true. It doesn't make up for the fact that the colonels and the, and the lieutenants and the generals let their men run wild like, like uh, uh, the Huns. Um, you, when, you, when you think about how, I mean, you think about, the reason why I got, I, I got into this is because I was working on my biography of Bulo, not Ethan's Bulo, but uh, his brother. And um, I wanted to know what it would be like for a lieutenant to have to go to war. And I never found Bulo at all in this war. Um, he's just a lieutenant. And I found his regiment mentioned two or three times. But um, it brought me to the manuals and what was expected of officers. And it's very clear cut that what went on was against every regulation in the manuals. So it matters not whether the colonel or the captain is in charge of the logistical service. What it matters is what they're supposed to be doing in the camp. And that's where the dereliction of the duty was, in the camp. And uh, as I tried to point out, if it had been more orderly, if there had been more direct supervision, uh, this, the level of starvation would not have reached the, the point that it did. Um, there's if Prussians had been a little bit more Prussian, it would have been better. Yeah, exactly. That's what we're saying. Exactly. Quite right. Uh, so Alexander Burns, West Virginia University, has a question for you, Mike. I enjoyed your summary of the Kartoffelkrieg. Late in the war, General von Merlendorf scored a fast-moving attack and victory at Brux, modern-day Most in Czechia on February the 5th, 1779. Is it possible that the Prussian army was developing an effectiveness in the petty war, much as they had during the Seven Years' War, that Schmettau missed after his departure from headquarters? Uh, there was a few few success uh, stories. Uh, Massenbach, uh, in addition to what, what uh, Alex just uh, stated, Massenbach had, uh, and I can't remember the other general, but there were two generals. One of them was Massenbach, who had some success um, in the, um, 
the, the Saxon Silesian theater, Massenbach was serving under Prince Henry, um, but I, I haven't gotten deep enough into my research uh, for that. I'm still trying, still trying to find my Lieutenant Bulo, you know, in the midst of all this. <laughs> okay, still digging, still digging, chip away. Dr. Legere from Eric Smith, with regards, it's rather like a wedding, this, isn't it? And, there's, and congratulations. Um, so with regards to the numerous infractions and violations of regulations that you described, to what degree do you think senior leadership of the Prussian army should be held responsible? Do you think it was simple lethargy or perhaps a fear of reporting the ground truth to the high command that enabled these infractions to continue or something else? No, it wasn't fear of reporting it because uh, the longer version of the, well, the chapter that this is, um, it went on right in front of Frederick's uh, view. Uh, Frederick could see it. Frederick knew it. The the officers, uh, I remember one of them, um, I forget his name, but uh, he was Frederick's aide de camp and he, and he told Frederick what was happening. And Frederick said, yeah, I can see it. And uh, everybody expected Frederick to, to, to rip someone, but he just walked away. Um, so this goes back, that's why I started the paper by discussing, you know, Frederick, you know, who, who was he by 1778? What was he? There's a lot of question over, over just what was left of him in 1778. Um, but uh, the, the few passages that I found, and I mentioned them in the paper, um, nobody wanted to step forward. Nobody wanted to assume leadership. Um, they were afraid that if they did assume any type of leadership, they would be embarrassed by the king. Um, the, the longer chapter that this paper was drawn from has numerous accounts of Frederick having generals arrested on the spot for being uh, late, arriving late with their columns. And uh, he, he was just a uh, kind of like a madman, to be honest with you. And um, he saw what was happening. The officers saw that it was, the general officers saw that he was happening, saw that he saw what was happening. The men in his suite, the officers in his suite saw him observe what was happening and, and nothing was done. So from what I've read so far, what I've researched, uh, the officers are trying, you know, most of these memoirs are written by generals. So they're trying to shift the blame by saying, well, you know, we couldn't do anything, you know, God forbid we meant say anything to Frederick, you know, to the king, um, we'll be embarrassed, thrown in jail, what have you. Um, so they're kind of, it's the blame game. Whose fault is it? Is it the king's fault because he allowed it? Was it the general officer's fault because they allowed it? I'm trying to bring it down to the, the, the platoon and, and company level and say, this is where the problem started. You, that's why I included in the paper, you know, that the stuff about the, the junior officers leaving while on the march and letting their men go, go crazy. That's where I believe the, the, the real problem lies or, or could be, can be found. Great. Cool. Thank you very much. And finally, one question. You're allowed probably like a sort of haiku in your response, because we are at 2033 um, in French time, this is, and we only have 27 minutes to get ready for the final countdown, the final wonderful, uh, um, the final firework display at the end of these wonderful five days. So brilliantly organized by Alex Mikabiridza. Thanks very much to him for all of the hard uh, leg work he's put into all of this for organizing such a fantastic uh, series of conferences. I've, the, 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 pa the panels that I've assisted at have been fantastic. I've had a very, very interesting time. So the question is, briefly, lady and gentlemen, um, what were the practical issues the Prussian recruitment system faced when drafting their soldiers? What did men do to avoid conscription? This is from Jonas Denif in Belgium. Ethan, you go first. So the problems faced in drafting soldiers? It says, the, what were the practical issues the Prussian recruitment system faced when drafting their soldiers? What did men do to avoid conscription? Um, so the practical issues faced, though my stuff is basically before 1806, and the Canton system, the practical issues were, um, one of the big things is landlords did not want their script, uh, serfs being conscripted, and basically no one there were enough interest groups that basically no one could get conscripted because exemptions were so widespread. Um, I've started doing research, though I haven't finished it, on the um, raising of the land bear in 1813. And so far, I haven't actually found, I haven't found a lot of instances of draft avoidance so far. I might run across them. I'm not finished going through the material yet. Um, there wasn't like a upswelling of volunteers, but there also didn't seem to be like 
there wasn't like the French response in the Vendée or anything like that. So nothing large scale. Okay, and Vanya, sorry, that message I just sent you is not for you, it's somebody else. <laughs> sorry. Vanya, would you like to reply to oh, the question? Okay, um, so I, I don't know exactly. Uh, we should, um, uh, Denis uh, Showwater had like a wonderful article back in the days about the, about the land veil, you know, about the glorification um, and so on and what was the real picture and that um, yes, there were parts of the of the society that were really excited, uh, but um, uh, when the land Gazette is adopted and, and uh, there is like um, no one is exempt, and everybody has to serve and so on. That, that's not actually accept, That's not welcomed by by many by many. There, there were. Um, uh, unrests um, there in several big states, uh, big cities. There are unrests against that. Um, so it's not. We have to a little bit. Yes, there was um, one part of the of the society. One part of the nation was excited in 1813. But we um, should not gloss over the fact that there was enough people who were not happy about that. And I cannot tell you like exact examples what people were doing not. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vanya. And finally, Mike, would you like to react? Uh, Vanya covered it. Uh, okay. Thank well. you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for being so, as we would say, so numerous in assisting at this very fascinating panel. Uh, more than 60 people were listening to us worldwide. So what, what, how, 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 how much better can it get? Um, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Time for a quick cup of tea. I think, before we all sit down, uh, put our woolies on and listen to the final paper in this wonderful five days. Thank you very much and see you in a bit. Bye-bye. Thank you, Peter.